โมทัสสะภะคะวะโตวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะบุทังดัมมังสังขังนามัสามิอย่าง blessings to you all in a few days time we reach the end of our three month range retreat and the way The sangha, Buddhist sangha, monks and nuns around the world will mark that day is with a ceremony called the Pawarana ceremony. The uh, full moon day the next week will be uh, called Maha Pawarana day. Pawarana means invitation. So it's the great invitation. And it's a monastic um, ritual or ceremony that is one of those useful or skillful means that the Buddha gave us, uh, because sangha implies community, community of monks, nuns, ordained people, and whether you're living just maybe one or two monks together or many monks and nuns together. There are always challenges living together as a community, especially um, when you're not blood relatives. It's, you, know, you may live like a family, but you're not a family because this monastery, as in, as is the same with many other monasteries, you get people coming from all different places, even different countries, cultural backgrounds, come to live together and practice together. And particularly during the three months range retreat, we don't really travel, go places very much. It's very limited movement, so you're together. And if you live together, a group of people for three months, well, it's uh, possible. Sometimes we can um, do or say things that literally break our rules as monks through lack of mindfulness. Uh, or strong craving coming up. Sometimes we break our rules. Sometimes we affect the people around us. Sometimes knowingly. Sometimes not knowingly. Um, so it's quite possible living together. We can annoy each other, hurt each other. It's just human behavior, isn't it? So the Buddha gave us this practice at the end of the retreat. We call it the the great invitation. So it means inviting other members of the community to speak up. Uh, at that time, you come together and speak up. Uh, if anything, we say if anything has been seen, heard, or suspected, I invite the venerable ones, you know, the other members of the community, to admonish me at this time. So you're opening yourself up as a Dhamma practitioner intent on freeing your mind from craving and attachment, which is the cause of suffering. Uh, recognizing that sometimes craving and attachment comes out in our speech, our actions. One's opening oneself up for admonition to the others to say, "Oh, if there's anything I've said or done, please let me know, so that I can make amends." And the very last word uh, is, is "patikarisami" in Pali. It refers to um, pati pati kama, which means the intention to rectify, change for the better, make amends one's behaviour. If if something has been said or done, something sometimes one doesn't know through lack of mindfulness. Sometimes one does know and remembers, but one is inviting others to comment on or bring up. Anything, and then one's making that wish, uh, aspiration to rectify behavior, improve one's behavior. 
And this is a you know, central principle in Buddhist practice is that as human beings, we always have this chance to learn from our behavior, from what's going on in our mind, what's going on in our speech and our actions, and change it for the better, learn lessons, improve, improve our well-being, our happiness, and then improving the well-being and happiness of those around us, because if we improve, well, they'll tend to benefit from that as well. We actually do this every two weeks. We have on the full moon and new, night, new moons, we have our Pati Moka day where we recite the rules, listen to that, and then make um, reveal any um, wrongdoing. If we've broken any rules, we reveal that to another monk. And again, we set our mind on not breaking that rule again if we have broken a rule. There are many, many rules of training we keep as Buddhist monks. So it's quite possible that one can forget a rule sometimes or unmindfully caught up in a moment of heedlessness or lack of clarity one can break a rule sometimes so every two weeks we're already recommitting to keeping the rules as a way of training ourselves uh, but particularly at the end of the range retreat we have this invitation ceremony where we determine carry on and learn any lessons that need to be learned, improve ourselves. And it's a way to clear the air because quite often after the range retreat there'll be some movement as people go to other places to practice. And you want to depart or if you're staying, if there are others departing, you want to clear the air so that... Um, next time you meet you can meet in peace so it's a way of it's an antidote <laughs> dare i say it a vaccine against grudges <laughs> it's an antidote uh, a way of boosting your immunity your immune system and your ability to not hold on to a grudge against another sangha member you're opening up talking things through clearing the air, being willing to accept uh, advice, instruction, um, and also give it, so that you know, there's no more hidden bad feeling. That's the aim. How successfully we do it, well, it depends on each individual, how sincere they are, and how they use the training, of course, but that's the goal, and it seems to work quite well because generally you go to Buddhist monasteries where Sangha live, generally speaking, it's a place where it's, people live together with mutual respect, harmony, they support each other, they cooperate and so on. Um, that's one of the attractions of a Buddhist monastery is you get that. Where in other walks of life it's often not so harmonious and people often don't cooperate so well and they don't forgive each other and there are more grudges and unfinished business. Um, so one of the aims of the Buddha was to help, this, help the lay community, the, the wider community, you know, by giving example how human beings can live together and partly you know, we have to learn how to listen to each other, support each other, advise each other when necessary. And this is what this uh, ceremony symbolizes and signifies for us in our practice. We, we can't always see our own faults, mistakes. Sometimes we rely on others. Usually it's a teacher or a more senior member of the community who has experience, so they um, may be able to notice something that we haven't seen because they're more experienced in the training, they're more mindful, more knowledgeable, wiser perhaps. Generally that's the case, but not always. Sometimes a junior person can be clear on something and they, they notice a more senior member of the community makes a mistake. <coughs> and so they humbly, respectfully, out of compassion might um, 
bring it out with a more senior member of the community. And uh, the Buddha even praised this, if it's done with the correct intention, coming from compassion, from understanding. It's not just, you know, you use this uh, system as a way just to get at other people, you know, picking up their faults all the time, getting at them. But if it's done with the right attitude, it can also be done by, a, say, a, a new, new member of the community can also admonish or instruct a more senior member. And in the time of the Buddha, there's a, a well-known story of the young novice monk, so you know, a, perhaps a teenager or very young um, novice monk was walking out on arms round and Venerable Sariputta, who was one of the leaders of the Sangha, enlightened monk, walking out, but he hadn't noticed that his robe wasn't on properly. And we have rules about the way we have to wear our robes and they're supposed to be even all round and his robe wasn't particularly even all round. So the young novice admonished the great terror, said, Venerable Sir, may I take leave to admonish you? And uh, Sariputta said, yeah, sure, what is it? And he said, well, do you notice your under robe is not straight and even as it should be. And Venerable Sariputta looked down and noticed that the novice was correct. And uh, he said, oh, thank you. Uh, you're correct, you're right. Uh, I haven't put my robe on correctly. And so he went aside and adjusted his robe. And this was generally held up as a good example of even a senior elderly monk receiving admonishment from a younger one. So done with, in the right way, with the right attitude, the right intention, it's a useful way we help each other in the practice. We, sometimes it's just letting somebody know about something that they're not aware of. So this comes about at the end of um, the Vasa, but it's not like it's a one-off event really. You know, the way Ajahn Chah encouraged us to practice is to develop this willingness to uh, receive instruction from others. Um, because if we're always closed off, you know, no one's going to tell me what to do, which is a very normal human kind of way of thinking, isn't it? We, we like to be our own boss, and we don't want anyone else telling us where to go, what to do. So, you know, the worst fears we have been realized in the last year or two with all the restrictions and regulations of lockdown and movement of people around Australia or around the world and all the do's and don'ts, you know, it brings up a lot of people's aversion, negativity, because we don't like that normally. We don't like being told what to do. So in a Buddhist monastery, there are a lot of do's and don'ts because that's the nature of this lifestyle. It's a way of training. We have training rules which we willingly, voluntarily take on. So particularly in the beginning that can be can be seen or felt feels like a burden. And so when one is admonished or instructed, sometimes there's a little bit of resistance there. Uh, but that's something you just learn and you look deeper, you look behind the resistance and you're seeing, oh, maybe it's coming from my own conceit, it's attachment to self, my arrogance, my my self-view, and I don't want anybody messing with with my self-view, yeah, pointing out my faults maybe, but you know, part of our practice is to deal with our own craving and attachment, our faults, our weaknesses, because they can be dealt with, because we can change. It may take a while, it's not always quick to our liking, we'd all like to be perfect, above reproach, perfect, liked by everybody, uh, always giving off a good image, uh, always doing things just right. You know. But that's not always possible because where we're coming from in our life is a place of ignorance, craving, attachment. So sometimes we get things wrong. Little things, bigger things. So it's not an easy thing to live with other people, um, but if one can see the value of receiving instruction, well, it's helpful, isn't it? It helps us uh, to go further in our practice, sometimes go further than we would go on our own. 
That's the value of teachers. So you live with a teacher like Ajahn Chah or any of the other great forest enlightened teachers. You know, one of the things they do is instruct their students. And sometimes that means pointing things out directly, saying things, comments. Sometimes it's just a look. <laughs> so Ajahn Chah is famous for his looks. When a monk you know, becomes unmindful, maybe eating too much, and then he looks up, feels a bit guilty. Oh, I've been eating too much too quickly, not mindfully reflecting on my food. And they look across and get a look from Ajahn Chah, and they, oh. <laughs> straight away they know where they've gone wrong. The look is all it's all it needs. Or monks talking too much, and they get to receive a look, the look, and then they wake up a bit from their conversation, realize they'd lost, the, lost their mindfulness. Uh, or the, the classic one, the monk looking maybe too long, lingering, looking at an attractive woman who's come to the monastery. And then they're looking at the woman and then they realize them maybe just getting lost in that desire, the attraction, and then they look across at Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Chah is looking right at them. Uh, something dies at that moment but that's good they say that let it die if it's not good let it die what dies well the desire di dies and you realize oh lost mindfulness but it's good it's dying and in the end the idea is you don't rely on the teacher you learn to do these things for yourself to be more mindful more aware through the practice so that's the monastic life but it filters out into the lay life as well. We've got to learn to live with each other and sometimes that means receiving feedback, comments from others, at least being willing to listen. Ajahn Chah used to say, you know, if they comment on you, say you're at work and someone comments on your work, your output, what you've been doing, the quality of your work, your timing, maybe somebody gives you a critical comment, you know, your aim is always to establish mindfulness and reflect, is it true what they're saying? And we all know some people have hidden agendas, hidden motives, so maybe they're just unnecessarily criticizing us, so we establish mindfulness and we have to reflect, because what they say, is it true? If it's not true, that's the end of the story. We can, having reflected wisely, with understanding, we accept mm, what they say is not really true. They've misunderstood, perhaps. Um, so we don't need to get angry. We don't need to get upset. We just know what they're saying is not true. If we get a chance, maybe we explain ourselves. Even if they still don't accept our explanation, if we know for ourselves, you can be at peace. Or sometimes it is true. <laughs> and we, ideally, we accept that because then we're becoming more aware of perhaps some limitation in our behavior, something we sh should have done we didn't do, or we did it badly or sloppily, or we missed something. You know, sometimes if we are keen to learn and improve, sometimes we have to accept other people, point out our faults, and that's the place we can learn. So if you, know, you stop and reflect, if it's true, no need to get angry because it's true. If what they say is not true, no need to get angry because it's not true. And Ajahn Chah used to say, well, you know, it's like they call you a dog when they're criticizing you. you. You don't have to bark back at them, get upset. Just put your hand behind your back and stroke a bit and ask yourself, do I have a tail? No, no tail. Well, then you're not a dog, so those words they're using are obviously not true. And this is a skill we have to learn in life, isn't it? Whether you're living in a family or with a friend, a partner, or, or on your own, but working and meeting other people, or in a monastery, you know, part of life skill is just learning to live with other people. So sometimes we have to take other people's comments and learn how to reflect on them. Ideally though, the aim is to get to the point where we can teach ourselves, developing that ability, the critical faculty or wisdom, 
Um, that's the purpose of the practice. We're learning to wisely reflect so that we can teach ourselves, so we can change ourselves for the better. Because ultimately we know ourselves better than anyone else knows us. So we have to learn that job. A lot of our practice is involved with that. Yes, the Buddha said the, the uh, farmer learns to channel water for his benefit, for irrigation maybe. Um, the fletcher, somebody who makes arrows, they learn to make a straight arrow. The wise practitioner learns to control their mind. That's what we're learning. You know, if people ask you what, what did the Buddha teach and what the Buddhists do, when well, they're learning to control their mind so they can free themselves from suffering and they can do more to help others be free from suffering. And the Buddha started from this way, this perspective is we have to learn some self-control, some mindfulness, awareness and learn to reflect and understand our behavior better so that we can affect this change, this improvement that we want. This is why the practice of mindfulness in daily life, meditation is so vital because you're learning to be more aware from moment to moment of your own mind. Because our own mind is always tricking us, lying to us, cheating us, deluding us all the time. It's just our habit because we are, have been brought up and conditioned by craving, an attachment, we attach to things, we crave things, we crave um, the objects of our senses, so pleasant um, experiences, you know, pleasant sight, sound, taste, smell, touch, and we crave to get rid of the unpleasant, unpleasant sights, sound, taste, smell, touch. And then on the level of the mind, the ideas, we crave and attach to the ideals and the ideas of who we are, what we want, who we want to be, and try to get rid of anything that doesn't fit with our ideals and our views on who we want to be, what we want to become. So the mind is you know, generally for or against. We're for the something or we're against it. And that becomes hardened through our life over time. So our mind becomes quite hard. So the mind of craving and attachment, it's hard, it's fixed. And that causes a lot of suffering. So you know, when we're going back to living together with other people, you know, why do we have suffering with other people? Because it's like two hard surfaces coming in contact. It's abrasive if we're very attached and we have strong craving in any situation at any moment and the other side do as well, well we have abrasion sometimes it's even physical aggression sometimes it's just verbal disputes disagreements sometimes it's just mental but it's still there's a hardness there and it causes suffering doesn't it when you disagree with someone you don't like what they've said or done, you remember it, you think about it, and the hard surface of your mind is eroding away something and erodes away your own happiness and you know, you're, you're setting up the course, cause for future abrasive contact with them, with that person and their views and their behaviors. Sometimes it's with ourselves, so our own desire is not to our liking, our own view on something, our own behavior is not to our liking, so we start eroding and uh, having an abrasive experience with our own mind. We get internal disputes and turmoil and pain and suffering sometimes. But that's what craving and attachment does, it hardens the mind. Whereas the practice of mindfulness, and particularly through meditation, you're actually, one of the results of that is, the, is that you experience the softness of the mind. The mind becomes softer, gentler. And just those words, you know, often people associate the word soft, gentle with weakness. Um, 
but they're not weak qualities. They're actually qualities that lead on to great strength of mind. They lead to insight and wisdom. They lead to the ability to change and improve and they feed many and nurture many other very good qualities such as patience and energy and effort. So they're not signs of weakness, but just the words can bring up that perception. And that's the, one of the problems with our mind. You know, the hard mind is fixed. So you just hear the word soft, gentle already, you might think, oh, that's not for me. I've got to be tough. This is a go-get world. I've got to be ambitious, get what I want, tough, push away all, all obstacles. Anyone that gets in my way, I'm going to push them out of the way kind of thing. But the softness of the mind that is mindful and develops samadhi through the practice is not a, it's not a, a weak quality. It's a sign of a mind that can actually look back and see itself. When you practice mindfulness, so you practice mindfulness of breathing or recollection of the word buddho, and you train yourself in doing that. You're learning to bring up this sense of self-control as the Buddha encouraged. Why does the mind become softer and gentler? Well, because you're learning to let go, not to immediately cling or identify with every thought, every feeling, every perception, every view and opinion. But you're setting everything aside and bringing up mindfulness and making that central in your, in your mind as you practice. And as mindfulness comes up more, more often and it's there longer, well, the softness and the gentleness comes because now your mind is in a place where it can choose better to pick up and develop a thought, a viewpoint, an idea, or set it aside. It gives you that kind of choice and freedom. And this is because, because there's a certain softness to the mind and one can start to look at things from different angles. Um, one doesn't just immediately grasp at every thought, every feeling, every view that comes into the mind. One starts to have that sense of separation and detachment. And with that you get this softness, gentleness. And the technical terms are uh, jitta mudutta, jitta lahuda. Softness, gentleness and pliability. The mind becomes pliant. You know, the mind of craving and attachment is the mind that is fixed, hard, not willing to see things from any other way. So you know, if you really want something, say when you're obsessed with something, you know, the mind of craving attachment, this is what I want, it's got to be this way, I like this. The mind is not very pliable at that moment, it just wants what it wants and doesn't see anything else. But the mind with mindfulness and samadhi, as these qualities come up, it's the mind is softer, gentler, able to look at things from different angles, pliable. So as you develop more mindfulness, say you can consider someone else's opinion, what they say, what they believe in, and you may disagree, but you don't suffer with it or get angry over it. You're just looking at it from different angles and you may decide Hmm, their view on it isn't quite the same as what I mine and I don't quite agree with it but you don't react with anger you can just see it as another opinion based on their experience maybe and everyone has different experiences the mind of craving attachment is hard so often there's it's difficult to get on with other people in certain situations because we clash against each other so Ajahn Chah used to say when it's monks, you know, we're like pebbles, uh, pebbles on top of the mountain, like up at Ajahn X's Kuti, there's a lot of rock there. There's an old trench where they were digging for gold in the old days. And the rock is very hard, hard jagged. And you, you, know, you pick rocks up there. Sometimes we've collect the rocks to do some kind of landscaping project or make a rock wall or something. And you know the rocks are hard and jagged. Whereas if you go down to the Yarra River, the other direction, down the valley, you, know, you get river pebbles, which are soft and rounded. But the, the rock down below comes from the rock above. Ajahn Chah used to joke. You know, he said, as you, 
as the rocks from the high places start to bash together, rub together, the sharp edges are worn off and you end up with the nice river pebbles down below where the water has kind of done the final smoothing and softening of the edges. Monks are like that. The more they practice, the more they develop mindfulness and samadhi, the more they have self-control, and the more they can see different views and they don't get so angry and attached to different viewpoints on things. And it's not because they become passive or docile like sheep, it's just they've learned to not follow craving and attachment through the practice. And for the laity, it's the same. You know, if you're practicing meditation every day, you start to see some of the jagged edges <laughs> of your mind and you realize that this is not good, this is suffering. So you start smoothing them off a bit by pr developing more mindfulness and meditating more often because it brings you peace. You know, this is the benefit of mindfulness practice, meditation practice. You start to feel more physical tranquility and peace and mental tranquility and peace. Ajahn Chah used to say, I can sit for um, an hour or something, a period of time, enter deep samadhi, because he's practiced in it. And that sense of peace, the refreshing nature of the samadhi, the peace, the tranquility can last for two weeks. One meditation. You know, that's expert level. But all of us gain something like that. You meditate for a, a, a while, and you may be very critical of yourself and think, oh, I'm no samadhi, mind all over the place. But that effort and some of that peace that comes up as you do it will last for a while, maybe the rest of your day. Already your mind is slightly better off because you've practiced focusing your mind on the breath, say, absorbing more into the breath and letting go of your normal thoughts and attachments and views and opinions. And you get a good rest from them. This is sharpening, uh, softening the jagged edges of the rocks of the mind. And you're giving the mind this chance to s settle down, separate from its normal attachments to the body, to thoughts, feelings, its normal reactions to things. And you're getting a nice peaceful rest so that you can contemplate and reflect on things from a place of clarity and peace. And this is how you can really change and improve your mind, change the way you look at the world, change the way you look at yourself, investigate the very idea of self. You know, to do that, you have to have a certain pliability of mind, gentleness of mind that comes as you practice more mindfulness, develop more samadhi. Then the mind can, it's, it's brighter, more refreshed, and you can have a look more closely at what's going on. You can question some of your views and things. And one thing you notice when the mind becomes more calm from practicing meditation regularly, you, you can trust some of your first impressions more without cluttering up the mind with a lot of thinking and, and reasoning. You know, sometimes we you know, in a situation where you're meeting a new person or in a situation where you have to make a decision, the more we think about it and get lost in our thoughts, the further we get away from making a good decision and understanding that situation. You know, our thoughts confuse us and clutter the mind. But as you practice more mindfulness, more meditation, sometimes you get sharper at just noticing your first impression in a situation, whether something is good, bad, right, wrong, just based on feeling and maybe the first few thoughts you have coming into your mind. And quite often, as you become a little bit more in touch with yourself, you know, the very first impression is often the correct one in a situation. And when you have to make a decision, sometimes you, the, the mind already knows what it has to do. But when we're not very mindful, we tend to then carry on thinking and reasoning and often go further away from the right answer or the right decision. And this isn't some kind of magical power, it's just you're getting more in touch with 
the mind from a place of clarity where you can observe things um, without bias, without your craving and attachment coming in and making the mind very hard. So then you're just going to have to follow past conditioning then. You know, what you like, that's good. What you don't like, that's bad, that's wrong. And you're just repeating often the same old stories with your mind. But when you calm the mind down with mindfulness, say, on the breath, you let go of everything for a while, then you can come back and look at things and often trust in some of that intuition and the, the wisdom you that arises at that point. And the way we train in this investigation, developing this wisdom is reflecting on the three universal characteristics. You know, the Buddha, Ajahn Chah, they taught us to reflect on impermanence, change, which is such a valuable way of understanding the world, both our own internal world of the mind and this body and then the world out there. Everything is subject to change. And we know those words and we've heard those words maybe many times if you're a Buddhist, we've chanted them, we've heard them in talks, but we don't yet experience them with the heart. So there's always that little doubt and that little wish that things don't change. It comes in, doesn't it? We don't like to accept change half the time. We resist change, we just hope it won't have to change on us. So whatever area of your life you look at, you just question that and investigate that truth. Is that true? You see, oh, say with your body, we don't like the changes that come with the human body. We don't like aging. We don't like aches and pains coming up when we've been in one posture too long. We don't like illness, that change. We don't like to feel hungry or too cold, too hot. We don't like the look of our body half the time and how it's changing with age and time. But that's change, isn't it? As you become more mindful, you become more mindful of change in your experience and that frees you from being caught into the fixed reactions to things. You, know, you look in the mirror. When you're not mindful, it's, uh, don't like that look, perhaps. But as the mindfulness comes out, it's, oh yeah, that's it, isn't it? It's just changing. Your skin changes, your hair changes. You know, to really free yourself from suffering, you have to investigate change, don't you, with this body. You know, how often we, with just the, the, the general appearance of this body, we're so attached to the way it should look, or the way we want it to look, or the way other people look. You know, they've, we just have this one image and we just want it to be like that forever and ever. Our, our, how we, our ideal image of this body or somebody else's that we like or are attracted to. But as soon as you're bringing up mindfulness and you set aside your previously held to attachments and maybe you can look back at your body or someone else's and see it from a slightly different perspective. Just something like hair, hairstyle. You know, your hair is made up of many individual hairs, which are just growing and falling out, going grey, getting dirty and smelly over the, over the days. Mindfulness exposes that, doesn't it? The mind that is peaceful can look at just something like hair and see it from a new perspective, from place of the reality of hair, say. And every other aspect of your body is the same. Every other aspect of the physical world is the same. Your new car, your new phone, your house. They're constantly changing and aging and getting older and dirtier. That's the way of the world. And Jen Chao used to say, everything in this world is preparing to run away from you, to flee from you. Whatever you put your mind on is not going to stay around for you to keep you happy. Any material thing that you have, that you own, that you say is mine, that you identify with, it's not. It's preparing to run away from you. This body is going to run away from you through aging, sickness and death. 
that house you've in, bought and invested in is going to gradually get old. You know, you, because of the house price is always going up, we have the delusion that somehow it's an investment, but the reality is it's getting older and it's falling apart and you have to constantly keep redecorating it, renovating it, changing it. Eventually you have to pull it down and rebuild. You know, we don't like that fact, but that's the truth. It's the house you have is preparing to run away from you. The car you buy is preparing to run away from you. Everything in this world is constantly in a place of uh, a flux, change. Everybody you love and like is changing. They'll all run away from you through death. And we don't like that, that thought, do we? But it's, it's the truth. But when you're mindful, you can start to look more deeply into those things that you crave, you attach for. The experiences, the pleasures of life. They are preparing to run away from you. That nice meal you had, that enjoyable day out, that bit of success you got in your work, the bonus, the paycheck, the praise from that person, is preparing to run away from you and it doesn't last, does it? Anything you can think of doesn't last. Nobody is praised all day long, every day, all through their life. Nobody gets paychecks all the time. They get their next paycheck and then they pay for things and it's gone again. Nothing lasts. This is a reflection, the Buddha said, bring it into your heart so that your mind is in line with the truth and the peaceful mind, the mind with mindfulness and samadhi can accept these truths, can see them. So they're not too upset by the way, the changing nature of this world. Our views and opinions, our beliefs can change. You know, one thing you believe one day and then another bit of information comes along over time and then your beliefs change, your views on things change. What you think is right and wrong can change. But there's this place inside where there is mindfulness and awareness that can witness that and doesn't have to, with craving and attachment, just buy into the view, the opinion, the belief and get stuck there and then become hardened and then abrasive with other people who may have differing views or when just reality exposes your views as not correct or inadequate. Nothing lasts. Even views and opinions on things can change. Our thoughts change, our feelings, our emotions change, don't they? We think when, when we're really happy, we just think oh, this has got to last, I just want this to last forever, I want to recreate it over and over again but it never lasts, it never stays. Depression, sadness is the same. We say, oh, I'm so sad, I'm caught up in my grief, or I'm so depressed, so angry. But if you look more closely from this place of mindfulness, calm and investigative skill of the mind, you keep developing that, you can see even the most depressing emotional state doesn't last, it's changing through causes and conditions. It may be challenging to do this, but it changes, doesn't it? You don't f think the same thought, feel the same feeling all day long. It may return back to you, but it's changing. Because things are subject to change, the, the highs and lows, the ups and downs of the mind, the changing physical experience of this world, it's dukkha not to be clung to as, as any lasting source of satisfaction or happiness because it's, it's changing. And the real happiness is the mind that sees and knows that. That's the real constant in life, isn't it? And not self cannot be kept, locked away somewhere as belonging to you yourself and kept to bring out when you want. It doesn't work like that, does it? You know, we'd like to have this body frozen in time at the right age and the right physical appearance with the right feelings 
and then just keep it there you know, bring it out when wheel it out whenever we want it the young healthy good feeling body ready to enjoy life we, we can't do it it's aging it's not self we can't command it not to do that so you might do everything you possibly can to you know the plastic surgery to keep you looking young the clothes to dress young the parties the experiences to keep you feeling young but in, inevitably you, know, you age you can't keep your body young forever but your mind can know that that's how you age gracefully we're bringing some mindfulness and self-control up then you know what's going on and it doesn't stop you keeping yourself as healthy as you can exercising eating well but this is a matter of the the mind isn't it the understanding of the mind that knows and sees and this is the way things are this body ages you can't keep it frozen in time forever and ever you know, it just does it's not going to work it doesn't work like that it's the nature of body and the nature of the mind you can't keep one thought in the mind all the time one pleasant experience all the time you can't do it it's changing all the time these things are conditioned and not self when you understand that and see that more deeply the nature of body and mind as impermanent unsatisfactory is not self one realization is that you realize it's always like this it always was like this and it will always be like this and this is one way the Buddha said to investigate the idea of karma and the sense of self and this, even the idea of um, karma and rebirth. You know, it doesn't really matter whether there is a next life or not in one sense because if you can understand the nature of this body and mind in this life as impermanent as not self and you really see that, you know it's not going to be any different next life anyway. <laughs> So it becomes irrelevant, the question of past life, next life. This is just the nature of phenomena, isn't it? Physical phenomena are constantly changing. They cannot be owned or kept by you. Mental phenomena are changing according to causes and conditions. Suffering arises through its causes and conditions. Suffering ceases according to causes and conditions. It was like that in the past it will be like that in the future as long as you attach to this body and mind as self you'll be setting up the causes for suffering but the mind that can see that it steps back doesn't it? You, you get a detached awareness and a sense of separation set it, stepping back then you can really be at peace and happy you're not grasping and, and hoping for things that are impossible anymore So the mind that puts down craving and attachment is the truly peaceful, happy mind. Even if we only do it briefly, that's some brief glimpses of the peaceful, happy mind. So the Buddha was encouraging us to develop self-control, to deal with the realities of living as a human being in the world, whether it's pre-COVID or the pandemic world or the post-pandemic world, these, these truths don't really change very much. You know, the external details of the world change a bit, of course, but the deeper realities of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not self, don't change. But the mind that sees this is not the mind that is caught in disillusionment you know feeling everything is meaningless it's all impermanent not self it's all meaningless it doesn't have to be like that the mind that sees things as they are is the mind of equanimity it's not irritated by the way things are it's not depressed by the way things are it just knows things as they are So whether we're in the Vasa or outside the Vasa, in the three months range retreat or outside, you know, the practice doesn't really change. 
like in the lay world, they have a, a day for the day after the Pawarana day. They say it's uh, the day where we leave the Vasa, the ending of the Vasa, going out of the Vasa. They use the word going out of the Vasa. But you, know, you don't go out of the practice. These are just conventional terms we applied for the calendar and the day you leave Vasa, then it's a day often people come to the monastery to make offerings because it's the end of Vasa, leaving the Vasa. But in terms of practicing developing mindfulness and insight into the truth, it doesn't change, does it? Whether you're in the Vasa or outside the Vasa, the practice continues. The truths are there all the time, so we might as well keep bringing our mind back to see the truths. It's not like you finish the vasa and then everything stops. <laughs> Some people are like that. They've kept their precepts, they've done their meditation, chanting, listened to the Dhamma, and then after the vasa, <laughs> put all that hard work behind me and now back to whatever, <laughs> the entertainments, the enjoyments, the computer screens, the socializing, the traveling, the working, maybe that you know, set aside the practice, go back to the world, and everything can fall apart. Perhaps it'd be a shame. Whatever you've developed during the vasa, if you've developed a regular meditation practice, keep it up. Why not? If you learn to keep five precepts, keep it up. If you've learned to keep eight precepts, continue the best you can. Just because the three months retreat finishes, no need for the practice to finish. We just continue on. So maybe I'll leave you with those reflections tonight.